Apologies for the wait, but my presence was delayed by pressing business. Of women? And drink. Are there any more, sir? Let us get back to unfinished story. So season two essentially covers the insurgents' path as they make their way to Mount Vesuvius and the Romans' initial attempts to bring them to justice. This is where we begin to get more of the actual concrete details as well regarding the timeline of events as the Third Servile War officially kicks off. In the show, we learn that in the weeks following the escape from the House of Batiatis, that the rogue group of gladiators have begun terrorizing Capua. If you remember from part one, we covered how in the immediate aftermath, the rebels seized wagons on the road that were filled with weapons and also repelled a group of mercenaries sent by Batiatis to hunt them down. However, in the show, we are instead introduced to the character of Sepius, who is fictional, but we're told as a young noble that has hired men to bring Spartacus's rebellion to an end, and who they only sorta, kinda, mildly hint that he's definitely fucking his twin sister, Sepia. Now, while there are some notable instances of this, as a general rule, the I word was taboo in Rome and would have been looked at in pretty much the same way we do today, as evidenced by the fact that it was a sometimes used political attack to spread gossip about one's enemies that they had a fondness for one of their own. Remember back to the whole Crassus Lycinia thing we talked about earlier. Right. When in Rome. However, Sepius' fielding of mercenaries to essentially police the countryside and hunt down Spartacus would have been in line with what rich nobles did after the man who started the precedent, Sulla. We would be here way too long for me to tell you everything about him as he was one of the most influential figures in Roman history, but let me quickly try and give you the abridged version of the OG Roman who marched on Rome. Who was Sulla? Much like today's American two-party system, the Roman politics of the late Republic were dominated by two main factions, the Optimates and the Populares. And also much like today, these two factions would fiercely battle one another over the issues of the day. The main leaders of these two camps at the time would be two rivals known as Gaius Marius and Lucius Cornelius Sulla and these two had major history going way back. You see, Sulla had previously served under Marius's command in two major conflicts, the Jugurthan War and the Cimbrian War, and it proved to be very capable at this being instrumental to Rome's victory. However, Marius was one of the most preeminent politicians of the time and was feeling overshadowed, so he began to take credit for Sulla's accomplishments while at the same time using his sway to try to limit as many opportunities as possible for his upstart rival. So don't tax my gig so hardcore, Cruster. Sulla's successes would prove to be undeniable, though, and he would climb to the top of the Roman political world just in time for the first Mithridatic War to kick off, which he was given command of. However, through some crafty trickery and alliance building, Marius was able to essentially steal Sulla's command out from under him. Here shortly it will make sense as to what a monumental deal this was. Sulla obviously did not take this lightly, and he marched with his troops on Rome also a monumental deal, but at this point his main focus was undoing the chicanery that saw him lose his command, which he did, and then he went off and proceeded to smoke Mithridates in battle, pushing him back out of Greece. While he was away doing this though, old Marius and his allies seized back control of the government and declared him an outlaw, so Sulla marched on Rome again, but this time he soundly defeated Marius and the rest of the populares after a brutal civil war. At the conclusion of this, he would take for himself the role of dictator, and with it, he would not only revamp Roman politics, he would also purge his enemies through the use of what was known as the prescriptions. Every day a list would be publicly disseminated with the names of those deemed to be the enemies of Rome, and if you found yourself on that list, you were, without exaggeration, fucked on every level, as you essentially lost the protection of the law and had a price put on your head. Literally, anyone who beheaded a prescribed individual could redeem it for a large sum and could do so without the risk of any prosecution. Furthermore, slaves of a prescribed person would earn complete manumission if they turned on their owner and led to their execution. Any property of said person was confiscated and became owned by the state, and eventually it got to such a point that some found themselves on the list simply for being one of Rome's wealthiest or having coveted assets. The fictional character of Lucius Caelius that joins the rebels during season two is a small nod to this as he mentions his family got caught up in the purge and was destroyed. 
I did have more esteemed lodgings once. A villa and horses. A family struck from this world by Sulla's black heart. If you want to know more about these topics, you should go check out the channel Flashback. They have a great video on it and deserve much more of a following, which, you know, I might just happen to know a little something about. Anyway, I'll link it down below. Make sure to go check it out when you have a chance and show them some love. Sola did eventually relinquish the dictatorship and died about a year after doing so in 78 BC, about five years before the start of our show's timeline. I tell you all this for a couple of reasons. One, because Sola's fingerprints are all over some of the events we're about to cover, which I will point out when we get to them, but also to give you further context of the state of Rome's affairs at the time. They were about five to ten years removed from a brutal civil war and the horrible aftermath. They were fighting major conflicts on two fronts with the top political officials battling Mithridates in the east and the top general of the time Pompey quelling a major uprising in Spain to the west. Given all of that, it's easy to see why Spartacus's rebellion was just not a major priority and why the assignment to snuff it out went to the man we know as Gaius Claudius Glaba. In the show, Glaba is begrudgingly assigned to this role deemed below his new position of praetor due to his established rivalry with Spartacus and the perception that he brought this headache to Rome and if he wants to keep advancing, he's going to have to fix it. We already know that the rivalry is just a plot device for the show, and we don't know much about the real Glauber, but let's speak on what we do know for a second. For one, given his name but lack of real historical notoriety, he was likely an outskirt member of the Gens Claudia, one of the earliest and most established families in ancient Rome. This is further established in Season 2 when old Sex Pestius Maximus here comments about one of Glauber's possible real ancestors, Appius Claudius Pulcher, losing a decisive battle to Hannibal. It's also safe to say he likely did have some sort of military experience as seven to ten years of military service was pretty much mandatory before being able to run for office. See, because Romans had a, well, romanticized notion, ooh, wordplay, that good soldiers would translate to good politicians, and the two things just went together, kind of like famous influencers in problematic relationships with minors. Allegedly. However, given the lack of concrete info on Glauber, it's also safe in my opinion to assume that he was nowhere near as high ranking as the Legatus position he is placed in during Season 1, as this authority would have come with his election to his new title in Season 2, and he most certainly did not outrank people like Marcus Crassus, as Batiatis indicates. Crassus' wealth is undeniable, yet he but holds the rank of Senator Glauber outweighs with that of Legatus. Speaking of rank, this is where we're going to circle back to all those political titles you've heard sprinkled in at times as they made up the political ladder of Rome known as the Cursus Honorum. What was the Cursus Honorum? Translated to mean course of honors, the order of ranks that an aspiring politician had to work his way through if he wanted to get to the top of the food chain was a mixture of military and political administration roles with essentially four major steps. Quester, Aedile, Praetor, and Consul. Yes, before you comment, there were more possible roles that one could attain along the way or directly after, but for time's sake, these are the primary four to focus on. I'm going to do a broad overview, but if you want to know more, you should check out Historia Civilis if you haven't already, as he has much more in-depth videos on this, and he's also very close to the 1 million sub mark, so go help him get there and learn way more about this than I could ever teach. Anyway, so all these appointments would be set at one year long so as to prevent anyone from getting too comfortable in a role. Just gonna let that sit there for a second, and okay. The first rung of the Cursus Honorum would be the Questors, which had 20 appointments made per year. This would have had a minimum age restriction of 30 years old, and as we mentioned before, came with a lifetime appointment to the Senate. There were many different types of Questors, as some could be assigned to a treasury or a granary, but broadly speaking, these guys served as apprentices, so to speak, for the more senior magistrates we're about to cover. They would assist with administrative tasks such as tax collecting, auditing, overseeing public auctions for seized properties, etc., but could be called upon in times of battle as well. The real-life Badiatis served in this role a few years prior to our show's timeline, but as we know, this is as far as he got, which was the story for many a quester as this was an attainable position for a young wealthy aristocrat or someone with a good family name, but this proved to be the ceiling for most people. 
Show Badiatis, on the other hand, would announce his campaign for the role of Edile, which is the next level up one could go for once they had reached their mid-30s. And this one was one of the more unique roles in that it was not a required step, but unlike the others above it, you also did not have to serve as Quester before you could go for it. The reason many did elect to take a turn as Edile is because these were the men who were in charge of the plannings of festivals and games, and this was a great way to get name recognition and some love for the public. So you see, this would make sense as a perfect role for Badiatis we see in the show to try to get elected for. However, this role was an expensive one to hold as most Ediles paid for these extravagancies out of their own pockets to curry favor. Moreover, the position also came with the overseeing of city upkeep such as temples, aqueducts, roads, public baths, sewers, and much, much more. Essentially, serving in this spot was a sign to the masses that you were committed to public service and it was nice to have on the old resume as there were only four elected per year. Next up, when a man turned 39, he was eligible to run for the office of Praetor, and this is where the real power started. Eight of these were appointed per year, and a Praetor's main function is best likened to a judge who was to oversee Roman law was enforced. But this would be a much bigger deal back in the day, as the Romans were fiercely proud of their legal system. Also, even though trials would have looked very much like our own do today, one of the big differences is that court proceedings at the time were a major public deal and were attended by many spectators complete with full audience participation, such as cheers and boos, jokes being made at the expense of those on trial, and even full-on crowd brawls. See, while in today's world a court case does indeed become a spectacle if a famous person is on trial, in ancient Rome the stars were the people arguing and judging the case, and so it was not uncommon for fans of these folks to come and see their favorite present at their big trial. Nowadays that just doesn't happen without being tied to representing a celebrity in some fashion, or I guess you could always wait around for this. I took 100 of the country's top legal minds and I put them all in a circle where they will take turns presenting defenses for my various alleged potential legal issues. And the one or possibly multiple of them that come up with the best arguments are each going to win this retainer fee of $500,000. I don't care how long it takes, I am not going to end up persona non grata like Logan. In addition to this, praetors were also the first rung on the ladder where you could actually begin to push an agenda as far as making changes to Roman law, which we will come back to more when we discuss the next position. However, the biggest perk that came with this is that they wielded what was called Imperium, which in essence granted them the ability to stand at the head of an army. And while they were still subservient to anyone higher in position, this meant you could find yourself called upon basically to stand second in command, such as Glauber's real life assignment to bring in Spartacus likely came from the simple fact that Rome was embroiled in so many other conflicts that the job would need to fall to a praetor. Where the Imperium was especially handy though was once the praetor left office, because then they were officially able to be assigned as governor to one of Rome's many provinces. And once they were there, away from the Senate's watchful eye, they could pretty much do whatever they wanted. Because I'm a stud, I'm ballsy, I don't take no shit from anyone. This included things such as openly taking massive bribes and leading conquests of unconquered lands where they kept a portion of the spoils of war. The fact is, most use this as a time to enrich themselves and make back much of the money that they spent getting to that spot. Unquestionably though, the most sought after position in all of Rome was that of the consul. Only two were elected every year with one of them taking the lead in a sense for a month and then passing it over to the other for the next month and so on. This was called holding fasces. This would be best likened to how we perceive the presidency in America and it was the absolute pinnacle of a politician's career as attaining it forever changed one's life. Once a man had been elected consul, the way he was perceived was forever established as one of Rome's made men, and the prestige it brought to one's family could set them up for generations to come and have your name spoken of in the highest of regards long after you were dead. He was a consul of Rome! To give you an idea of how big of a deal this office was, just know that Roman citizens did not mark the year of their birth in the way that we do today by saying, I was born in the year 73 BC. Instead, they would say, I was born during the consulship of Marcus Terentius Varro Lucullus and Gaius Cassius Longinus. 
Essentially, the consuls were the head of the Roman state, trusted with defending the Republic as the supreme military commanders, and for setting the political agenda of the time. See, they had the ability to call the Roman Senate to meet at any time, and when they would convene to debate or vote on an issue, the speaking order went as such. First, the consuls would each get their say, then any former consul would get to speak, followed by that year's elected praetors then the former praetors, and then if they got that far, which eventually they pretty much never did, the questors would get to weigh in. Knowing that, it's pretty easy to see how the entire political landscape could end up dominated by only a few as they were the only ones who ever got to argue their point. The consuls could also veto any legislation put forward and even veto someone else's request for the Senate to meet, basically picking and choosing what would be debated and when. They also oversaw and policed the elections for the following year's positions, and so being consul meant you had unilateral authority to give your allies a leg up for their upcoming ambitions, or take a well-placed bribe for someone looking for a favor. Anyway, when Sulla marched on Rome, he was one of that year's consuls, and now that you have the context, you can see how Marius stealing his command out from under him was an unprecedented thing because even though Marius was a former multiple-time consul himself, this was just not done. It would basically be like whomever is the current president while you're watching this, getting their commander-in-chief position taken from them by like George Bush or Bill Clinton or something. It would be a massive deal. Once Sulla had stepped down, one of the reforms he put in place was a 10-year gap in which a former consul had to wait before he could hold the office again, which didn't last, but in theory it was a good idea. Like I said, there is way more to this, but at the very least, this is a basic understanding of how it worked. All right, now that all that is out of the way, let's come up for air and get back to the rebellion. So one thing we can say for sure is that the real life Globber very likely felt the same way his show counterpart does about this assignment being beneath him as you're about to see. For one thing, at first, Rome plainly just did not take this seriously at all, as evidenced by the fact that Glauber was not given regular soldiers, but militia. He was likely told to pick up whatever forces he could get while on the way, and while theoretically this area should have been the geographic home to hardened veterans who previously served under Sulla, they were unlikely to chase a seemingly glory-deficient quest in order to help some nobody. <gasps> a nobody? <laughs> who farted? Nobody! <laughs> the name might have given it away, but Spartacus's revolt would come to be known as the Third Servile War, which meant this was not the first time the Republic had seen a major slave uprising. In fact, they were seeming to become a trend about every 30 years or so. About 60 years prior to our timeline, a Syrian slave named Eunice, who claimed to be a prophet, led a violent insurrection on the island of Sicily, capturing one of the cities in the middle and using it as a base of operations. This was likely due to the fact that around this time the Sicilian slaves were dealing with new arriving masters who had just acquired much of the area and they were much crueler to them than what they had previously been accustomed to. They would end up defeating four separate praetors sent with militia forces before eventually they were finally put down. Then, about 30 years later, also on the island of Sicily, the Second Servile War would break out, and to sum it up quickly, this time it was due to a situation where about 800 slaves were granted freedom by the consul as part of a recruiting drive for soldiers, and when the owners of those slaves heard about this, they said, The fuck you are. And so they decided to take backsies on that whole freedom thing, to which the slaves replied, The fuck you are. And from there, it was on. This lasted for about four years but was contained to Sicily and eventually was crushed by the Romans under the consul Manius Aquilius. Capua itself had seen a minor slave revolt not terribly long before this one as well that was led by a Roman citizen who was a former knight, but this one was put down quickly by a praetor with less than a single legion. So as you can see, it's somewhat understandable why Rome didn't bat too much of an eye at Spartacus and his group since nothing like this had ever really amounted to a whole lot before and praetors had been sufficient previously in routing would-be slave kings. Plus, after all, the last attempt had been head by a former Roman who was no match, and these were mere barbarian gladiators, so they assumed Glauber could handle this with even less of a force than previous revolts. Barry Strauss goes even further in with how he describes it in the Spartacus War. For the Romans, gladiators were to be fed, trained, cheered, adored, ogled, bedded, buried, and even occasionally freed. 
but never, never to be treated as equals. From the Roman point of view, once Spartacus and his 73 companions left their barracks, they were no longer gladiators. They had shrunk from a fight, hence they were moral lepers, cowardly, effeminate, and degenerate. They had shrunk from the glory of the arena to the shame of the banditry. They were not soldiers, but runaway slaves, fugitivi. As a slave and a Thracian barbarian, Spartacus was despicable to Romans, and as a former allied soldier, he was pathetic. Alithia even comments on this back in season one. A duality of his kind, admired as a gladiator, yet despised as a slave. They were sorely mistaken though, as this was very different from before, and Spartacus's personal particular skills would have made him Liam Neeson levels of uniquely suited to leading this charge, so underestimating him would prove to be costly. Yago skills. What are you gonna do about it? Spartacus's Thracian upbringing would have given him excellent skills as a horseman, excelling in hit and run tactics, ambushes, trickery, and deception, and other means of unconventional warfare. His years living in the mountains would have given him extensive knowledge of how to attack from and defend a higher position, and Thracians were also natural plunderers, so he would have known how to make good use of anything they came by. However, the secret weapon that he possessed that others before him did not was that he had personal experience serving in the Roman war machine as part of their auxiliary. This meant that he not only knew Roman strategies and battle tactics for when it came time to engage them, but that he could use that knowledge to bring the insane organization and training methods to his own men to mold them into a formidable force with a specialty in fighting Romans. His years honing his own personal fighting skills in the arena could not have hurt either, and I'm sure he was more than a match for the average soldier, which many of them would soon find out. In the show, the decision to go to Vesuvius is not exactly a clear-cut one, as Crixus has his intent set on rescuing Navia, and after he receives news that she was passed as a gift from Rich Dominus to Rich Dominus in the countryside, his attempts to find her become the catalyst for the group raiding wealthy villas in the area, which is something they did do. And I just want to take a second to point out really quickly that they are really committed to doing this bit where someone is about to orgasm and we get a scene of that person being like stabbed or blood spatter of some kind as a replacement for the climax, which I admit was highbrow art as a younger man, but this time around, it was definitely a depreciating joke. <laughs> Woo, come on, that's funny. So we find out eventually Navia was cast off to the mines, and this causes a split in the group as to what actions to take next, as Crixus wants to embark on a seemingly assured suicide rescue mission, while Agron, one of Spartacus's other top lieutenants, moves towards Vesuvius with eyes on eventually raiding the port city of Neapolis, where fighting warriors who could swell their ranks are regularly trafficked as slaves. The character of Agron is fictional, but who, stay with me for a second, is essentially a stand-in at times for a real person that was known as Kestis, who does appear later in the series under totally different circumstances, and whom we will come back to at that time. Anyway, now, there were most certainly differences in opinion as far as strategically what to do next, but in real life at this point it mostly had to do with quests for riches, and while there would be a formal split coming, it wouldn't be for quite some time yet. Instead, I think this is the writer's way of not only creating drama, but also highlighting that the group was likely moving at times in two or more sections executing different plans. As for whether Spartacus and his crew ever actually rolled up on the mines or Neapolis, there are no records that say they did, but at least for the mines, it was highly unlikely as they would have been in search for more able-bodied and trainable fighters to liberate, and the majority of those that made up the ranks of the mines would not have fit that description. The way the mines are depicted as for all intents and purposes hell on earth is pretty accurate though. They also never attacked Capua's arena either as depicted since this would have had a 0% chance of success and so logistically this would have been a nonsensical move. Most of this is really just filler though as a means to give our characters something to do of note while they ultimately make their way to the mountain by the end of the season. There was no badass siege at the base of the mountain like we see in the show because in real life Spartacus and his group actually lived on the mountain itself, and when Glauber and his soldiers arrived, they just made base camp at the hills of Vesuvius, which 
actually was not a crazy notion as the rebels had an advantageous defensive position or I have the high ground. There was only one road up the mountain and it was not anywhere near ideal to march a legion up, let alone a thrown together group of forces. And so he assumed a better course of action would be waiting and starving out the gladiators. It's not a groundbreaking strategy, but it probably would have worked had they kept their guards up just a bit better. They figured the rebels couldn't get down the steep and jagged side of the mountain, so they pretty much just left it unguarded. And as Napoleon once said, never interrupt your enemy when they're making a mistake. Remember the folks I mentioned in the previous part that were from the rural countryside and came to join Spartacus on the mountain? Well, they proved valuable since they were familiar with using wild grapevines to weave baskets that they used for farm work. These vines were in abundance on the mountain, but contrary to the visions on the show, they did not repel down as these might have been strong, but not that strong. Rather, these were probably used more like handholds and support as they carefully climbed down the steep terrain. The one or two that were left behind up on the peak then tossed the weapons down and the gladiators were suddenly poised to strike. They then attacked the Romans defensive camp with one source saying they were able to surround it and another saying they possibly snuck in through a hidden exit or through a crevice, but either way, the Romans were caught completely off guard with many of them being slaughtered in their tents. Surprise, motherfucker! Not being able to get into formation left many of those who did try to fight in a 1v1 match with a seasoned gladiator, and the majority were no match. The insurgents then plundered the spoils, which no doubt replenished them with food and more weapons, and then likely assumed control of the camp itself as their new base of operations. We don't know how many Romans were killed, but it's safe to assume a good majority. We also don't know what happened to Glauber, as he is not officially recorded as killed in this skirmish, but he also is never mentioned among historical records of any kind after this. This could mean that he either perished, or that possibly he was so humiliated by this defeat that he fucked right off out of politics entirely. And so ultimately giving us the payoff of Spartacus personally being the one to kill him and fulfill his vengeance is perfectly fine with me. Another major death that occurs during this point in the show is that of Enemaeus when he is killed by the most creatively named character in the whole show, the Egyptian. We don't know for sure how, and it likely wasn't on Vesuvius itself, but in the real records of what happened, it's referenced that he fell in battle somewhere around this time, and so their placement of it as a massive event here is good with me as well. At this point, word of the rebels' success was beginning to spread, and with it, they got another influx of runaway slaves, this time mostly herdsmen who would have been primarily Celts and would have known the area incredibly well, serving as the perfect scouts for what would come next. After Glauber's defeat reached the ears of Rome, they sent two more praetors to try essentially the same thing, Publius Verinius and Lucius Cosinius. We meet Verinius in the show much earlier where he is placed as Glauber's rival trying to snatch up literally everything from him, but this was done for drama's sake as the real Verinius was sent in response to Glauber's defeat, and the show pulls a little switcheroo in the timing of their dealings with the rebels, but it's not a huge thing. So I think it's safe to say he probably didn't finger fuck his wife. Are you sure you got the right hole? With their new additions paying dividends early, Spartacus and his group next surprise and rout Verinius' legate named Furius, along with 2,000 of his men. And then shortly after that, they catch Praetor Cassinius slipping and ambush him while he is bathing. We see them get killed in the first episode of the final season, but it's depicted differently, and it's implied that their position was given away as a strategic move by Marcus Crassus to assume command, but in reality, Crassus was yet to officially enter the chat. Verinius's and Spartacus's forces play a period of cat and mouse for a bit, and this appears to be where we get the beginning of the split between Spartacus and Crixus, as it is recorded Crixus likely wanted to attack Verinius and continue taking the fight to Rome, whereas Spartacus was of the mind that while they had had success, they were not winning, and this was likely due to the fact that he had served in the Roman army and knew what they were up against better than his Gallic counterpart despite what we see in the show where he is not as keenly aware of this. His real plan was to try and flee north to the Alps where they could then split up and return to the areas of their homelands that were still beyond Rome's reach. But see, many of the Celts and Germans that made up his forces were likely born into slavery in Italy, and so the idea of going home probably just didn't mean the same, and in the end Spartacus was outvoted. 
However, they did manage to at least compromise that they needed more time to prepare before squaring up to Varinius. So, they marched south into the pasture lands to recruit more herdsmen to their cause and to buy more time to train for the battle to come. They also likely would have taken local prisoners such as ranch or farm owners to help be their eyes and ears in the area and this helped them to evade and stay many steps ahead of the Romans in pursuit. Their next stop would have been a little farming town known as Forum Ane, where we are told the group goes absolutely mad, pillaging and killing everyone in sight against Spartacus's orders. We see this battle of wills play out in the show as far as the treatment of Roman civilians, and we're told in real life Spartacus did understand the importance of imagery and not wanting to appear as the savage barbarians they were claimed to be. I've never seen them act like that before. After that, for the next six months or so, the sources get a little light again as far as the information, but we do know that at some point during this time period, the rebels engage and defeat Varinius. And while I really enjoy the way they see him off in the show, in real life he escaped with his life and retreated back to Rome. We don't know for sure what happened to him after that, and there is a Publius Varinius who was governor of the province of Asia about a decade later, but we can't say with certainty that he is the same guy. What is true though is that Spartacus ended up with his horse, and the rebels also seized Varinius' standards, which are banners and symbols of the legions that are extremely protected and ultimately would have been the slap in the face that formally made the Romans see this for the threat that it really was. It also gave Spartacus, who was already likely a household name by this point, godlike levels of fear, fame, and infamy. Because I'm a stud, I'm ballsy, I don't take no shit from anyone. A massive influx of new recruits followed, and with numbers varying by source, a good solid estimate based on historical context would put them at around 40,000 at this point. Rome finally now understood what it was up against, and they were about to up the ante in every measurable way. That's going to do it for part two, guys. Full disclosure, I had not intended to make this a three-parter, but there is just a lot to cover, and this makes it easier to digest. But, but fear not, the wait for part three will be far shorter, as I already have it more than halfway complete as I'm speaking to you now. Also, I wanted to take this time to plug the Patreon specifically for this reason. Part one of this was plagued for its first 30 days with copyright tag issues by the Real Housewives music owner, and also by Arnold Schwarzenegger's business page, which put a serious limitation on its reach and negatively affected it. The goblins who run these things apparently believe using a 10 second snippet in a near hour long video entitles them to the credit for the whole thing, to which I very respectfully reply, All of you can suck my nuts! Well, suck on them so fucking hard you can't even breathe through your mouth, only through your nose, but it'll be even hard to do because my fucking fat dick will be clogging that shit. Who knows what issues I'm going to have with this part, and let's say I have something cooked up for the end of this and what will now be part three that I'm not willing to cut and is most certainly going to get tagged, meaning I will have to contest it. Because I'm a stud. I'm ballsy. I don't take no shit from anyone. All of this to say, I want an unblemished version of this to exist somewhere, and so that is what the Patreon is going to be for. I will upload it as it is meant to be seen there, and then do what I can for YouTube purposes. Also, if you join the Patreon, you will have access to it a week earlier, and of course, I will put your name in the pretty lights of the credits. I'll be back with part three very, very soon. Until then, thanks for watching. I will see you on another time.